Amen. That's right. And also, um, one of the things he left with us, and I'll, and I'll leave it with you all, he probably has shared it with you too, but it is to prompt, to focus on God, on not, on to God. not front, focus on your problems. That's right. Focus on God's promises. Amen. That's if right. we can do that, we can get through anything. That's right. So, we thank you, Pastor Lynn, for uh, inviting us and, and for the church family just showing us love and warm hospitality. Amen. We thank you. God bless you. Amen. Amen. The man, the myth, come on up here, brother. The man, the myth, the legend. <laughs> I, I honorably serve under him at the Pitt Detention Center, and he's just amazing there. As a matter of fact, he, 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 you ought to hear him. You ought to hear him in when he's ministering to the inmates, and one thing that really struck me, he went with me one day to B5, which is where the heroin addicts are, and I thought he was going to say something. He just sat there, and he just he just sat there, and he had his, he just kept looking around, and he just kind of wrote some things down, and at the time, we had to go talk to the lieutenant, and he called something that, that I didn't catch. He said, uh, we went to the lieutenant, and said, you got some people in there fighting. And I was too busy teaching, and they weren't really there. And I noticed how some were kind of, you know, act kind of different anyway. But he said, you got some people fighting. And he told me, he said, whenever I have a meeting, I always have one of, one of our uh, bishops staying out away from it and watch and tell me what's going on because I can't see it. I'm too busy doing what I'm doing. And it was amazing because they had been. Of course, the first time I come in here fighting was kind of obvious because <laughs> when I walked in, they all sat down. And the guy bent his head over and blood was running down his face. And I said, uh, what's going on? Nothing. Oh, something's going on. Nothing. And, I, and I, I said, I need to call the guards in here. Another guy looked at me so nobody could see him anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so I called the guard in. But, but this man here is just awesome. One of my truest and almost awesome friends. Go on, Perry. A spiritual father to me. He just, I can't say enough about him. How many love the Lord for this morning? How many love the Lord? Amen. 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 Sound like uh, somebody knew about the Lord more than I do. Amen. 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 I thank God for just being here today. This is an honor and a pleasure. And Pastor Linton, I do not take this lightly. Amen. 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 I truly thank God for the opportunity to stand before my brothers and sisters. I thought that thing was off, amen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> to stand before my brothers and sisters and to tell you what God uh, uh, means to me. I kind of got it mixed up because I thought this was church anniversary, amen. <laughs> but my wife told me this morning it's homecoming. <laughs> either way, either way, we have a message from the Lord. There's a story of the farmer whose dog Followed him to town one day. When he tied his horse and buggy to the hitching rail, the storekeeper saw the dog panting and almost out of breath. The storekeeper became a little rude with the farmer. Why did you make the dog run all the way while you rode? Look at him. He can hardly stand up. The farmer said, he is not tired from following me to town. What tired this dog out was his foolish zigzag. There was, there was an open gate. He zigzagged to explore. There was a hole in the fence. He zigzagged to explore. There was not a tree stump he did not explore. This dog is not tired from running He's tired from zigzagging. And that's the way that many of us saw at times. We zigzag from one situation to another. We zigzag from one diversion to another. We are never stand still long enough for God to direct us in the path that we are supposed to go. Amen. 
Whenever we find or uh, facing a situation, we're going to zigzag over there versus find it an altar somewhere and fall down on your knees and ask God for direction how to solve the situation that you're in. God is our director and he's, he's our Lord. Yes. And we love him to the utmost. There is no way in the world that you can change my mind now about the God that I serve. That's right. That being said, I give honor to God my creator on today, the blessed Holy Spirit that leads and guide me and to the to, to, to his son that gives me redemption. I give honor to Pastor Linton, to First Lady Linton, to the deacons and the deaconess, to the mother, saints, and friends, and to the official boards of this great church. I look out there, I see that, um, many of the fellows that I've worked with for years and years and years. I see those that, uh, I, I, I listen to Pastor Litton talk about, uh, about, about the trick they pulled on him. Amen. <laughs> but I remember when I first went there, some of y'all remember Jack Wynn? Amen. Amen. I had just left the big city of Chicago when I uh, started at PCS Phosphate. Texas Gulf, and I had never heard of gigging a fish. <laughs> Jack man told me, said, Ed, I'm going to take you gigging on tonight. I said, yeah, right. He said, all you got to do is say, I'm going to give you a stick, and then when you see a fish, you stick it in it. I said, yeah, right. <laughs> what fish is going to stand in there while I walk through the water and let me stick a stick in here? <laughs> but went down to the edge of the, you know, down back then with the old mine office, down in the mine. Got over there in the Panama River and he said, any spot you see that is dark in color, stick a stick in it. I'm still thinking he's, you know, pulling the tail. Uh, so I walked over there. And, uh, you know, I, I, I looked down there, and uh, he said, stick a stick in it. And I did. And up come the flounder. I said, now, this is a dumb fish. <laughs> a dumb fish. But it's no dumber than I was, amen. I, I was sent one day to the tube grill to get a sky hook. <laughs>
but 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 uh, um, um, I uh, long long between the thought there. Amen. But again, what God what God talking about? Someone in Alabama. Oh yeah, someone in Alabama. He said to me, and I think he told my wife says, uh, you know, it's not the job that gets you down; it's the schedule. Nobody works hard at Texas Gulf. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You had a few days when you got a little dusty, yeah. but you don't work hard. It's the schedule. Get up in the morning, same time, same station, driving the same route every day. But then, but then when you get there, you do like a lot of folks who sit down in the mind department, you go to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Look, I was quiet since the being the middles my last 15 years with the company. But my first 15 years now, I was the radio man. I fixed all the radio on the flash site. I crawled through roofs and ceilings and pulled them wild for antennas. Amen. Amen. And I used to have to wake guys up to get in the office to go in there and do some work on their radio. Give me see. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But again, those were, those were all good, all good days. Amen. Amen. All good days. All good days. Amen. Amen. Harvest Greedley once received a letter from a woman stating that her church was in distressing straits. She wrote, we have tried every device we could think of, fairs, strawberry festivals, oyster suppers, a donkey party, turkey banquets, Japanese weddings, poverty socials, mock marriages, <coughs> Grab bags, box socials, and necktie socials. Then she added, what advice would you give me to take back so I can help my church to grow? We are in great demand there for growth. The author replied, try religion. <laughs> Simple statement, try religion. Again, we thank God for just being here, trying to get my thoughts together here, you know, because I, I am really excited about being here. Your pastor is one of the most cordial, humble men I have ever met. And I'm a clown myself. But, you know, when I put, my, when I put, my, put, put this on, then I have, have to represent the bishopship. I should have left it home. <laughs> and kind and considerate person that you have ever met. You got a jewel here as a pastor. Pastor Lynch is one that loves the Lord and he loves people. I found out that he had more degrees than a thermometer does. <laughs> He's still working on a note. They told me this morning you will be uh, uh, you will get your next one when in January? No, December 9th last day class. December 9th. But that, but that that's going to show you he, he believes in preparation. And it takes preparation to lead God's children. And I know some folks say that God called me, so he's going to tell you what to say. Yeah, right. God will send you to people to prepare you in order to be able to, to dissect his word. So the congregation can hear his word. I tell folks all the time, you know, that, 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 that the Bible says, uh, how can they believe without the word? And how can they hear the word without a preacher? And how can he preach unless he be sent? We can all read the word, but you can't hear what's on God's mind unless you're sent by God. Now, I know that's kind of difficult for some to say because they say, well, I got as much sense as thousand men have. Yeah, you might have more. But you weren't called for this purpose. That's right. You weren't yeah. called for this purpose. And I just thank God for knowing Pastor Lynch. And I, I got to know him really well at the at the jail. 
I'm trying to use what this seven hours on this bed. I got to know him very well at the jail, at, at, at Manfred. He was out when he first came on board about 10 years ago. 15 years ago? Has it been that long? Boy, friendship make time go by fast. All right, all right. But then I got to know him and I saw this, this sincerity in his heart. And then when time, we, when we had to go and I had to find another uh, 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 assistant, amen, the first person that came on my mind was Pastor David Linton from Possum Track down <laughs> down in <Hibbs. laughs> And I have not, uh, he has proven himself to be a man of God and love the inmates. You know he go out there each, what, two, two, two or three times a week now for the thing called a spa program? Monday and Friday. Monday and Friday, amen. Sharp, sharp program. The sharp program, I, I said star, right? The sharp program. And there is no monetary values to it. But the only thing he get is he's getting rewards set up now, see? Amen. We got a song out just for you, you know, that uh, it says, send up the timber. And, that, and that's what he's doing now, sending up his chamber. So when that time comes, then he can get his Savior say, Well done, David Linton. Travel with me, if you please. <clears throat> and uh, the later part of the hey, hey, yeah, I'm going to say something about that because it's, it's a long ride back to Fort Barnwell. <laughs> 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 I was at a, we've been in conferences since, since, since the first weekend, well, we've been in conferences since last February, but uh, we've been running since the first weekend, September, you know, from, from New York to wherever we go, we just, I mean, and we got two more conferences, well, three more to go. And then our last one, if y'all want to go with me, would be in Ghana, West Africa. So we go over there. And that was, a, and that was an interesting story about this uh, Bishop Ebenezer of Safar. He is the son of a king. And their faith is, is Islam. But he wanted to be a Christian. So he gave up his throne in order to become a Christian. And in three years' time, he changed 36 churches from Islam to Christianity. And then he called me, he had been visiting, you know, visiting, visiting you know, over there. He wanted to join our organization. So we went over there in 2013 and consecrated him as a bishop. And he is now with us. In fact, he's stateside now. But uh, we'll be going over there in December for the last assembly. Uh, and we just thank God that we're able to do things of that nature. Now back to the wife now. I met her, amen. I, I met her some. Wait a minute. <laughs> I got to get it right because there can be a evil one. Amen. I, I got to think about this one now. Amen. But anyway, 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 I met her in Chicago. And some of y'all may not know it, but you know, I, I wasn't born with a collar around my neck. <laughs> And when I saw her, she came in a bar, a tavern I was in. Y'all ain't been in taverns, have you? Y'all ever been in a lounge and tavern? Amen, amen, amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> but I met her in the tavern. And I saw her. I said, mm -mm. I'm going to marry her. I met her on the 30th of May. Is that right? Is that close? Don't shake your head now, man, because I got to run home with you. <laughs> the 30th of May and the 29th of July, we got married. And that was 46 years ago. Wow. Amen. 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 I'm going to put this in there, make it even longer, but 
thought she'd do a good thing when she saw it. <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord. But she is a, she is a, a, a wonderful person. She's one that uh, keeps me straight. Amen. And I'm glad she's sitting back there because I can't see that leg moving. <laughs> so that if it's pushing too long, that leg go to moving. You know? So that means, you know, <laughs> it's time for me to sit down. But she gives me time now to add in to get the butterfly lined up in my stomach. Amen. Because I tell all ministers, regardless of how long you've been preaching, if you don't get nervous when you get up here, meet me in my office. Amen. Right. 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 No, this is sacred ground. This is, this, this is not playtime up here. If you get up here thinking that you are bigger than God, meet me in my office. That's right. Because you cannot get up there. I know we wear robes uh, uh, when we preach at, at times. And, and if that robe is a shaking, meet me in my office. I don't care how long you've been preaching. And the females that be preaching, but if that dress here is a shaking, meet me in my office. Because this is this is serious business. And we, just, and we just thank God for that knowledge. Homecoming, church, 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 church anniversary. As I said, I got it mixed up, brother, until this morning. But turn a bit with me, if you please, to the book of Proverbs, the 22nd chapter, or division, I don't want to say it, and the verse 28. That's in the Old Testament. <laughs> and, and look now, I tell you like I tell folks, don't try to be so small. You got a table of content up front. Look in the table of content. God in his infinite wisdom has the writers of the Bible to put the table of content up there for folks like me. If you can't find it, go to the table of content. Amen. Amen. Proverbs 27 chapter, verse 28, one verse. Remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. Remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. Let us pray. Father God, it's me again. I don't have the ability and the knowledge to teach your children. Father, I only have such to call upon you. So Lord, guide my thoughts, guide my heart, and most of all, guide my tongue. That everything that I say be within the realm of your teachings. And Lord, I pray that you will open the ears of your children and let their hearts be fed with what your humble servant has to pray. This is my prayer. I pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 When you remove the landmark from the church, you mess up. Yes. No if and but about it. We live in a cruel and a mean society. Today, folks will kill you and have less emotions than swallowing a fly. Yes, sir. I use a manuscript. Because if I don't, I'll, I will use up these seven hours on this Saturday. <laughs> Pastor told me years ago, he said, well, you know what? He said, you know, if you get up there and preach, God will tell you what to say. I said, he did. And I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget it. I use a manuscript. Folks today, a man will kill you. Some say that this generation is a lost generation. Sociologists and criminologists are constantly trying to figure out why this is so. Well, if they ask me, and they haven't, I would tell them the reason why we have removed the landmarks. We no longer follow the principle that our forefathers adhered to. And those principles that keep them in the line with the plan of God's salvation for us. God planned before the foundation of this earth. And those plans that enabled them to keep marching in spite of the seemingly insurmountable obstacles. Yes. 
It's how time he get back to his plan. Time to get back to the landmarks. That's right. Now there are many landmarks, but today I'm going to just talk about three. One of the landmarks is character. Yes. You talk about character, and you got to fight some folks. You talk about people not having the character as a Christian, you got a battle on your hands. Who does the pastor think he is? Well, you're not exemplifying Christ when I see you down in your brother, That's right. backstabbing, as we say, That's right. gossiping about your brother. That's not a Christian character. And the church, the church, the, the church that Christ created, this church that every Christian church, I don't know how long it's been here, but I do know that every church that planted in the name of God had to have some folks filled with character. Yes. Yes. Without character, there is no accountability. That's right. So I want to say when you point in one finger, you got two or three pointing back at you. We always blaming others for our shortcomings. Come on. Right. Because we don't have character. Right. Oh, we go, we can sing and shout. And, and I'm hoping that my uh, my 93-year-old mother would be with us today, but uh, but they had feelings to go to. We got two feelings in the area that I did not realize. But you can, but you can sing and shout and jump all day long. But if you don't have character, you can't get along with the person sitting next to you. You can see a lot from up here. <laughs> you can see our eyes rolling. You can feel the hostility sometimes coming from so-called Christian folk. Amen. That's right. Those that go around with a with sign on my back. I be saved. I'm saved. I'm sanctified and set aside. If you got to tell me, you ain't sanctified. If I don't see it, if I don't see it, you ain't saved. Amen. Amen. A Christian always exemplify the character of Christ. That's right. If you don't exemplify that character, then you need to go back to the morning bank as you used to have in the old day. Everybody wants to blame the pastor, blame the school system, blame the church. Blame it on everybody but themselves and where the blame lies. Amen. That's right. Character starts in the home. Amen. That's right. You come to church for one reason. Not to dis or have you in this lay, but the church is not for saved folk. That's right. Amen. Oh Lord. <laughs> the church is not for saved folk. The only reason you come to church is to gather strength from one another to be able to go out in the hedges and byways and compel men and women. That's right. Amen. Many times we call about a character. We come to church, sit down, listen to good music, and I was hoping that the musicians stayed there because I was I was gonna sing my song today, but uh, he done cut everything off now. <laughs>
Parents must instill character with them, within themselves and then in their children. The Bible said that each generation will get weaker and wiser. And the reason that God stated that is because he knows that, my, that mankind will become self-centered. Yes. But because the Bible states character is interwoven with your soul. Your character is interwoven with your soul. Your soul and character is who you are. My daddy told me and my brother, and, and, and they both have crossed over now, but, but he told me and my brother, he, he, he said, if you ever mess up my name, which is my character, which is me, if I, even, even if I'm gone, I'll come back and get you. <laughs> and if I'm here, he said, if I ever see you mistreat anyone to put a mark on this family, I'll kill you and eat you myself. <laughs> I believe in that. <laughs> Your character is who you are. Your character makes you. The old saying is character is the real me. Character is higher than intellect. And no one can climb above your character limits. That's right. No one can climb above your character or the limits of your character. All right, Carl. How do you build character? I'm going to cut this short, amen, because I, I don't want the battery to run out. <laughs> All right, Carl, how do you build character? Church, the basis of building character is the commandments of God. That's right. Psalm 1 and 11, 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Yes. A good understanding of all they that do his commandments. 1 John 5, 2 and 3 says, by this we know that we are love that, that, that we love the children of God, for we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. We must inoculate every child with the serum, amen, of values and character. That's you know. Let me give you some statistics as to why that is necessary. Amen. Amen. Do you know that? Uh, do you know that 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 that, that uh, in the past uh, uh, decade, two million, two point six million have left the church. Mm -hmm. Yes. Think about that. Two hundred and sixty thousand young adults. Effect for the church each year. This, now, folks, this is scary. I don't, I don't, I don't know about y'all down here in Denver, but this is scary. Yes, man. Only thirty-five percent of church members attend a Sunday morning service on Sunday. Thirty-five percent of your congregation, and that's everybody. That's every congregation. We call that that faith a handful. Only 10% attend Sunday school and evening services. Y'all have evening services here? Amen. Tuesday night. Tuesday night. Everybody? We have Tuesday night. Okay. Well, you know, some churches have service in the morning, then in the afternoon. Let me tell you a little story about that. The, the church I pastor now, by the way, I, this past uh, week, I've been there 30 years this year. In fact, they gave me a banquet last night for 30 years. But about 10 years ago, those without character began to complain. We stand in church too long. The folks got to sleep. They start at 11 o'clock and they're out by 12. I didn't pay attention to it at first. The folks got to sleep. They start at, at 11 o'clock and they're out by 12. I said, okay. They're back again at six. So if, if you want to ask the folks down the street, we're going to start at 11, be out by 12, and come back at six. I heard no more, heard no more about the folks down the street. <laughs> <laughs> See, we get hours in in two, hour, two and a half hours one time. And down the street, they do 
a howl in the morning and a howl in the afternoon. Our children cannot do what they have not learned. That's right. Amen. Cannot do what they do not know. Amen. Mind me a story. Years ago, in the early days, Pastor Linton, the young children in the back of the car, they had been to a revival. The preacher said, every home should have character, every home should have discipline, every home should love the Lord. Every home should be God-centered. On the way home, Pastor Lynn looked in the back of the car back there and uh, Daniel, what's that son's name? DC. DC and Bethany had tears run down their eyes. He said, what's the matter with you? Well, the pastor said that every home should be a Christian home. We want to go home with you fellas. <laughs> Our children are raising themselves. Right. While we are busy trying to gather silver and gold, That's right. they are raising themselves. I'm from the old school. I believe, amen, I believe that, uh, that, that uh, parents have a responsibility. Now, don't y'all throw nothing at me now. This is just me now. <laughs> I believe that parents have a responsibility. Each parent has a responsibility. I know society of the way that it is is having us to do all work two jobs and the wife go out and work and the husband go out and work, children go to school, and in the, and in the afternoon, what you got? Tired wife, tired husband, and some irritated kids. Now, set priorities. What's more important for you to have two cars in the garage? Are your kids meeting us at that Pitt County Detention Center? Mm. Mm. Amen. That's right. Amen. What's going wrong? We have a set priorities when it comes down to, to, to character in our home. The basis for building character, I said, is the Ten Commandments. And we are hoodwinked to think that we are not our brother's keeper, and we don't even teach our children that. I love this technology. I love the way that I can get on the internet. Well, let me take that back. I'm trying to get on the internet. I got a call from a little four-year-old at church and help me up there. I'm trying to get on the internet. But, 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 this internet thing is a good thing, but it has called us to become individualized. Yes. I don't need you. You don't need me. I get on this thing and talk about, I got friends in China, Russia, I got friends everywhere. I don't need you. And then, and then we wonder why our children, when they leave home, can't get along with one another. They fight it. You sit too close to me. I, there, there is a commercial on TV saying, he breaking too loud. <laughs> All because we have become individualized. No one in the home is teaching character and the responsibility because you are too tired to do that. But that's not, but that's not what God wants us to do. We are children. We are to raise our children and to give them that knowledge of knowing that they need each other. But the devil has set traps for us. The devil has set traps for us. Got to think that we don't need each other. That is, the, you know, separation. You know, I'm here today with, uh, with, 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 with y'all folk. <laughs> And the Bible said, no, no, I'm, I'm sorry, the Bible said this. I say this. Somebody said, Sunday morning is the most segregated day of the week. Yes. Yeah. That's right. And we go to him and how. <laughs> but we've been taught that, that we don't need one another. Y'all, y'all, y'all have heard this story. Well, it can't hurt me. 
but they're doing their business. That person's cows a problem, that can't hurt me. What another person does is none of my business. But church, we are our brother's keeper. Yeah. Have y'all have y'all heard this story? A rat looked through a crack in the wall to see the farmer and his wife opening up a package. All right, some more food, said the rat. I wonder what it is. I'm going to have a party on tonight. But when the package was opened, he was shocked and dismayed to discover that it was a rat trap. <laughs> he was running into the barnyard yelling, thinking he would get some help from the barnyard friends. He said, there's a rat trap in the house, a rat trap in the house. The old rooster chuckled and scratched and said, <laughs> raised up the head and said, excuse me, Mr. Rat. Now I can tell this is a grave concern for you. But I don't have a problem with it. I don't even go in the house. I'm not and cannot be bothered by it. The rat turned to the pig and told him, there's a rat trap in the house, a rat trap in the house. The pig said, now right, Mr. Rat, look, I sympathize with your plight, but there is nothing I can do about it. All I can do is pray for you. How many times have you heard that? All right, you know, I'll pray for you in a minute now, but I can't help you out. When I fall on my knees tonight, and, and be assured sure that you are in my prayer, I'll pray that you are able to maneuver around that trap in the dark. The rat ran over to the cow. The cow said, now oh, come on now, Mr. Rat. A rat trap, I can't even, I mean, that don't even phase me to get caught in a rat trap. How can I get caught in a rat trap? So the rat returned to the house. Head down, dejected, he faced the farmer's trap alone. That very night, a sound was heard throughout the house. Like the sound of a rat trap catching the prey. The farmer's wife rushed to see what was caught. In the darkness, she did not see that it was a poisonous snake whose tail had been caught in the trap. As she approached the trap, the snake bit her. The farmer rushed up to the hospital. They gave her serum to combat the poison, but later that night, she developed a fever. Y'all know, I'm getting that. <laughs> she returned home. Now, everybody knows that you treat a fever with what? Fresh chicken soup. <laughs> and the farmer took his hatchet to the farm yard, and the main ingredients that night was the rooster. <laughs> His wife did not get any better, so, he, so friends and neighbors came to sit with her around the clock. In order to feed them, the farmer had to have some meat, so he butchered the pig. In spite of all that, amen, the farmer's wife did not make it, she crossed over. And so many people came to her funeral that the farmer had to have some more meat, so he did what? Slaughtered the cow. So the next time you hear that someone is facing a problem, and think that it does not concern you. Remember that when there's a rat trap in the house, everybody's in danger. <laughs> Matthew 22 and 29 says, You do ill, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. We have to love one another as Christ loved the church and gave his life for it. Must have that love that says, If you are hungry, I'm hungry. You are naked, I'm naked. You are destitute, I'm destitute. If this community is hungry, this whole church should be hungry. That's what Christianity is all about. Right. Some of you are, are my age. Y'all remember in the good old day, if something needed, if something were needed in the neighborhood, everybody joined together. Wasn't well, no such thing as amen as welfare at that time when I was growing up. The welfare was the community. Because everybody knew that if a rat trap is in the building, everybody is in trouble. Amen. Amen. Person got sick down the road from my grandmother's house, the whole the whole neighborhood went down to the house and ministered to that 
person that was there. Someone passed away. Everybody was down there giving them that law. That's right. Because the rat trap was in the house. We have to teach God's word. God lost sowing and God lost a reaping. I'm going to get my point in a minute. And make wise decisions that will build character in our families, in our churches, and in society. We must maintain that firm, that, that, that firm support structure that supports the family and the church. And those structures are the, the commandments of Almighty God. Now, another landmark, and, and I'm going to move quickly because I hear the battery getting kind of weak up here. <laughs> we, have, we have to have respect. We have passed, there is no respect. We do not have a kindly, affectionate feeling for one another. I got my eyes to be yours. God bless me, and so he'll bless you too. God, the Lord, bless each of us the same way. The Bible says you will always have the poor among you. Now you might say, well, no, if, what, if, if God is blessed, why does he bless the poor? Because if, you, because if everybody was rich, there would, there would be no way for us to really, really exemplify Christ in our lives. If everybody had the same amount of money, there would be no way for us to exemplify Christ by giving, by loving, by supporting. But those are the things that we must do. Another one, amen, and, and I'm going to move on down here now, is change. The church hates to change. Now maybe this don't fit y'all. But I know the church, of the, the church of the, our pastor, if you, if you say we're going to move the table over two feet, why? <laughs> Churches have been split over the, 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 the color of the carpet to go on the floor. And I don't know about y'all, but we got the folks in the church that they got their own special seat that, that they sit in. And you better not be in that seat when they come in on Sunday morning. Because they get angry. And they're on their way to heaven anyway. <laughs> Had to change. The church had to change to meet the needs of the world. I said, I said some young folks back there. I said, I said some young folks sitting back there. And you cannot preach the same way. Oh, I can hoop. Oh Lord, I can hoop. I can throw my legs up there. I can holler. Amen. I can get so sweat till the sweat is running all down my car. Amen. I can do all those things, but that's what won't help you. Because that is only emotions. So therefore, the young people that's in, that's in church now, they want some substance. That's right. They want something that they can feel and carry with them for they lead the church. That's right. Yeah. And I'm so thankful that I see you got technology. Our general bishop is always saying, Bishop Paul, you got to get on board with the technology. I said, bro, I'm trying, I'm trying. Because this is the new generation. You want what? Regardless of how we feel or how healthy we feel now, we're going to leave here. So who's going to take our place? If you don't have the youth in the church changing things around so they'll be able to come and exemplify Christ in their way of doing things, you won't have a church. So technology is good. I'm glad to see that you're using this. We're not quite there yet at, at Griffin Chapel. Amen. We're going to, maybe, uh, if I can hold out another year, we might get there. But we have to change to meet the needs of the What got me to church, but I'm a, a little boy growing up around the Fort Bama area, was my granddad used to go out there and had these great big wooden barrels. Y'all see those wooden barrels with the slots on them, with the slats? Used to season that barrel. The lemonade. Pour sugar in that thing and stir it up. And that's what got, got the young kids, other, other than getting a whooping if it, if it didn't go. But, that, but that's what wanted 
cause us to want to go was something to draw us in the church. That's right. You cannot clean a fish while he's swimming. That's right. <laughs> Amen. You have to catch that fish first. And Christ said, come just as you are. That's right. And some churches want, well, you can't wear this in church, and you can't wear that in church. Amen. I come to Church of Christ. And 30 years ago, when I came in the, in, in the ministry, they didn't even allow string instruments in the church, no guitars and no drums. I said, well, take out the piano and go, it, it's got strings in it. That was the mindset. It would be, that's fine. But now you have to change things, church folks. And the biggest hindrance in the church is the word that, it, well, we used to didn't do this way. That's the biggest hindrance. We didn't do it this way. We used to do it this way and that way. Well, that was then. That was fine. That got you to where you are now. You used to have wood pews, no, no carpet on the floor. Raise the windows to keep the, the, the to let the heat come in and and the, and the cool come in. That's right. Had lamps and things. I wasn't here, but I knew they had lamps. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't have air conditioning. You raised the window. Right. You had a fly spot to kill the flies when they came by you. But you changed. You got air conditioning. Beautiful stained windows now. So if you can change your building, why don't you change your methodology? That's right. The word of God is saying yesterday, today, and tomorrow. That's right. But the application of it has to change. That's right. What suit me? We got to know people now going, do y'all, do, do you know what a, the church you could dance in and be dancing in church? When I first introduced that to Griffin Chapel, I thought they were a tar and feather me. <laughs> you made the world in the church. Did you come here? You in the world. Everybody in here came from the world. We are the world. We are the church. And the thing that get them in church, if you find something wrong with the fish as you call them, you clean them up. If your children are doing, if your young people are doing things, if they want to work in the church, let them work. Do you realize how much passion uh, and, and this is for you? Every Sunday morning, my young people, I got one, he's, he declares he's going to be the bishop. He's five, five years old now. I sat down with my young people and I listened. I listened. What is on your mind? What do you think the church needs for you to be satisfied to come to church? I listened to them. And believe me, they give me some good insight. What do you, what do you know that now? There's a thing called a generation gap. After Lincoln, I, I, I mean, he, he, go, he goes to jail now, but he, you know, he's still a baby, you know, you know. So, so, so he, he goes to jail now and communicates to some areas that I can't. Because of that generation gap there. And unless you recognize that as church leaders, your church will not prosper. It will not grow as God called it to grow. Last but not least, in witnessing, battery getting weak. You gotta have some witnesses. The church needs some witnesses. The church don't need any more leaders. The church don't need any more officials. The church doesn't need any more chiefs. It was the officials that called the problem in the first place. It was the officials who created the disturbance. It was the officials who began jealous of Jesus. And it was the officials who had him arrested and the officials who nailed him to the cross. Church don't need any more chiefs. The church needs some witnesses. The church needs somebody to tell about the goodness of our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. That's right. The church needs somebody to stand up and, and say, For God I live and for God I die. Church needs somebody to 
to go in the hedges and byways to tell them about this man called Jesus. Tell them about how he healed the blind, how, how he raised the dead, how he did all those, those miraculous things. That's what the church needs now. When the pastor preaches up here all, all, all Sunday morning or whenever the time is called, when he finishes, you should be ready, ready, or ready to go out in the streets and tell somebody about the goodness. That's right. That's why I don't jump when I preach. I heard a lady say one time, well, what did the preacher, no, he sure preached today. Had a good message. Well, what did he preach about? I don't know, but it sure sounded good. <laughs> that's, that's not what happened to We need some witnesses. We need somebody to go out there and tell them that Jesus is Lord and that he is still alive and that he is God in our lives and he came now to rescue us and give us salvation. That's what we need. He, he did good to me. So I can testify as to his goodness. I don't know all the things and how he does things in my life. I, I we're looking at this psalm up there. You know, you know how you know, he, he, he grabbed me and turned me around, put my feet on a solid foundation. I don't know why he loved me so. I don't know why he looked beyond my soul and saw my need. That's right. I don't know why he why why he said, I want to make you a preacher. So Lord knows I was just like that man, you know, I was, I, was, I was like a rabbit, I was running. But God saw something in me, so that's what you need to tell. If God has done anything in your life, you should be telling folks about it. That's right. Amen. No one, no one should have to, you know, we come and God blesses us and we don't tell God or tell others about the blessings that God has given us. God loves you. I don't know how God works. I'm often wondering how in the world can a pigeon take a miles from home and turn them loose and find a way back. I don't know those things. I don't know all the things that happen, all the current that go through the brain. I don't know those things. I don't know how why a bear go into a cave in the winter time and stay all winter. I don't know how a bee can make honey and never ask the dietitian how sweet it ought to be. <laughs> I don't know these things. I don't know how a black cow, amen, can eat green grass and get white milk. And when it's cheering, it turns to yellow butter. <coughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't know these things, but I know Jesus. I know he's a savior. I know he's the one that can do anything but fail in your life. I know he's the one that picked me up and turned me around. I know he's the one that can save you and then give you salvation in spite of all the mess you have. Whosoever believes in him should not perish. That's right. I know these things. Hello. I know these things. I know that he can reach down and get you. The song said he had to reach way down. When he found me, and then his whole head got dirty. He reached down in the muck and mud and picked me up. <laughs> so I know what he can do. That's right. And if he can do it for me, he can do it for you. If he's able to do this thing for me, he can do it for you. Tell him about this. Tell him about the earth. Tell him about the green grass that God has planted here. And tack it down with pine trees and oak trees and, and willow trees. Tell him about these things. About how he healed the blind. Gave healed the sick. Gave sight to the blind. These are things that we as church folks are be telling. But instead we come in now, we sit here and listen to your pastor preaching good songs and singing and get up there and close our little Bibles up and go home and don't say nothing to nobody. Jesus. That's, not, that's not Christianity, folks. That is not Christianity. Am I better than we know? That's not, that's not Christianity. Christianity is exemplifying Christ in every aspect of your life. Because God has Christ has suffered every point.
whole bunch of men. So there's nothing you can go through that Christ hasn't been through already. And who would who would love a Christ like that? Who would love a God like that? Who would, who would love a God that that is that is that is able to keep you and keep you from falling? Who would love a God like that? Don't you take God for granted? Don't you take God for granted? Because if, if it wasn't for the love of God, you'd be like a bubble in the water, gone just that quick. Amen. But because of the love of God. And keep in mind that every day, every day that you wake up, there's a reason for it. That's right. You don't wake up just to, you don't wake up just to put your pants on and, and run out and get a cup of coffee. That's right. There's a reason for God waking you up every day. That's right. And that's for you to go out and witness to somebody. Be a character in your home. Gain respect back. Respect the church. Respect the leaders. And that's one of the, the, uh, the crises in the church. I, I, I'm not going there. Maybe if, maybe if you invite me back, I'll go there. <laughs> but, 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 but there's a reason for you getting up this morning. Not because you're so great, but because you are his eyes, you know, his feet. Yes. We are his eyes, his feet. We are the one that does the work. He said, you will do better things than I do. Better things than I do. Not because you're a great tall. But because there are more of you. And his time here was only limited That's on right. earth. But we were here until he called us home. That's right. Some have been here for 70, 80, 90 years. Yeah. So we are here until he called us home. So therefore, we got work to do, church. That's right. The church is the light of the community. And the Bible says that you know, we are also the salt of the earth. And if you put your light on a bush or on a hill, who can see it? And if you're not doing the Christian work, you ain't got no salt. I want to probably beat you. I want to wake you up. <laughs> if you're not doing God's work, you ain't got no salt. You can pour it on them pork chop all day long. Have it so salty to your healthy ego or drink a gallon of water after all. But if you're not in your soul, That's right. Amen. Yeah. then you won't do a Christian work. That's right. Don't remove the landmark. Church got here by respect. Church got, got here by the commandments of Almighty God. That's right. And the church will continue whether you are in it or not. Amen. Christ said, my church I build upon this rock, and the gates of hell shall not be built against it. Amen. Mm -hmm. yes. I don't care. I see some of the people trying to tap the church. How, how simple minded can you be? You're going to mess with Christ's church. The man that has all power. That's right. And, and you want, and some want to the call, want to call a disturbance in the church. You're hell bound. I can't put it any other way. You're going to hell. Oh, oh, oh by the way, there, there, there is a hell. That's right. That's right. There but, is. But you listen to you folks on TV. There ain't no hell. Hell is down here. No, there ain't no, no hell is down for There is a hell. And there, and there is a hell. And there are not many things in life that you have control of, but you can't control where you spend eternity. That's right. It doesn't make any difference how young you are or how old you are. If you, have, if you have not accepted Jesus as your personal Savior, amen, you need to get that thing right with you and God. That's right. Amen. Because time is coming when you're going to have to face Him. The Bible says, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. Amen. amen. And if you have not accepted Him as your personal Savior, if, 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 if you have not invited him into your life, he says, you know, and it's not hard to do. He said, I stand at the door and I knock. And if you open the door, he will come in and sup with you. That's right. If you're lost, he said, seek and you shall find. That's right. And if you trust God and love God and accept him in your life, 
He'll open doors for you that, that no man can close and close doors in your life that no man can open. I love the Lord for this afternoon. I love the Lord. Because he first loved me. And it does not matter who you are. Don't matter how long you've been on this Christian journey. If your life is not where it should be, in our Lord and our Savior, now is the time to get it right. That's right. Now is the time. Yeah. If there's one, amen. Let me up to the, the extended chair. Let me the uh, invitation, amen. We are extending the, the invitation to discipleship. Just because you've been in church 40 years don't mean you're saved. Just because you have been hanging around or uh, uh, ever Christian church all your life, it don't mean you're saved. But now is the time. Whatever is on your mind about Christ and his salvation, any doubts, you got a pastor. Go to him and he will explain this plan of salvation. Anything that you feel like you that that you need that and that you need for God to give you, He's willing and He's able. That's my message for today.